Hello, welcome to another Tweedy Outdoors video. I've come down to Pusey on the train, quite an unpleasant train journey, but I doubt there's much entertainment value in boring you with how overcrowded it was and so forth. And I'm slightly retracing the steps from a very early Tweedy Outdoors video, or at least the first part of the walk, where I walked from Pusey to Avebury with a wild camp in the middle, not camping today, just a daytime stroll. I've, uh, I've had this odd hankering, perhaps it's the cold weather, to make fondue in a ditch. I was talking to Mr WC21 recently about the danger of over-promising in YouTube videos, so it might be a ditch, it might not be a ditch. I apologise in advance if there's any disappointment. I remember there was a particularly appealing ditch atop Hooish Hill, which is not that far out of Pusey, along the White Horse Trail, so that's where I'm heading now. I am going to tell you about my unpleasant train journey just ever so briefly, just because I thought the irony there is quite interesting. A big part of why I come and do these countryside jaunts is I just want to get away from people. I live in London in a sort of densely packed Victorian terrace. There are just people everywhere all the time. And I really crave some time when I just can't see any other human beings. Of course, the reality is in order to achieve that, I have to get on a train first. That means being uncomfortably close to lots of other humans, really packed train. So uh, I think that actually slightly plays into why, why it's been so long since I last got out into the countryside. Increasingly, I think this is just age, isn't it? The idea of being on a packed train is really unappealing. I just, there's no fun in driving either. I mean, you know, that would rule out the bottle of Gervais Chamatin as part of the walk. So, uh, not sure what the moral of the story is. I remember this turn off from the track from a previous walk heading onto the White Horse Trail. Maybe I was already on the White Horse Trail, I don't know. First uninterrupted view of the hills, or largely uninterrupted view of the hills here. Over to the right hand side of the screen is the Giant's Grave, and the hill over to the left is Huish Hill, which I'm heading up. If I recall correctly, last time I was here, I attempted to make a gag about the fact that Bethnal Green has spruced up nicely or something to that effect. Still on the White Horse Trail, nice view of the Giant's Grave along this section. Just a quick visual demonstration of the fact it's a bit chilly today. No need to run away, I was just trying to say afternoon ladies. The viewers will be disappointed if I don't get one of those in. Passing through the village of Orr now, I think I almost certainly said the same thing when I came through here last time, that it's uh, sad to see this pub very much long-term closed. I don't think that really has any prospect of reopening, but it does look like it might have been great back in the day. The Cheshire Cat, if ever I've seen one, straight out of Alice in Wonderland. Funny little place, or it's strange to me to find a village that no longer has a pub, but has a primary school. I suppose it attracts kids from the surrounding area, maybe some of the other little villagers. Apparently, originally, up atop Hooish Hill here, there was a village until as recently as the mid 20th century. Now there's only really a farm up there. There it is, Hooish Hill. I remember from my previous walk, this little ring of beech trees seemed sort of somehow deliberate. I don't think there's any, anything like a barrow in there, and it would be unusual for a barrow to be at the foot of a hill like this. Just a bit of flat ground. There aren't a lot of other beech trees in the immediate vicinity, so it looked to me like this had been planted quite deliberately for some purpose. Who knows what? As I recall, this is a bit of a punishing climb. It doesn't look very high up though, does it? It doesn't look very far off. You can just about probably see a bench at the top there. Almost at the bench. <laughs> right, made it to the bench at the top. It's a possibly little known fact that the Tweedy Outdoors icon, that little thing you see in a circle on the channel when I'm making comments and so on, that was uh, that photo was taken here. I think I was standing possibly around about here with that backdrop. Sorry this is going to be all in silhouette today because pointing into the sun. Two and a half years ago and uh, fittingly I'm wearing the same tweed suit today. That's the view from atop Hooish Hill. So this is the ditch I had in mind today. <laughs> These earthworks are marked on the Ordnance Survey map and they're part of a, a larger series of earthworks atop Hooish Hill, which I think is also, as I said, sometimes called Ore Hill. And I believe they were excavated by Colt Hall at some point in the past, don't know the exact date, 
and there was the usual roll call of different eras of prehistory represented here from the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, the Romano-British era, everything but the Neolithic, I think. Some sort of settlement boundary, as I may have mentioned earlier, up until apparently the mid 20th century, there was a small hamlet on top of Hewish Hill. Now there's just a farm there. Although there is a fence across the ditch here, it is still marked as open access land. It looks like somebody's created a, a handy gap in the fence with some gorse bushes there to snag my tweeds on. I wonder if around here might be a good spot. A little bit shady there, but I get a little bit of shelter from the gorse. This is the run of the earthworks, the ditch beyond the fence there. Still all, as I said, open access land. I think this looks like a nice spot. There is a little bit of a breeze today, so I'm sure cooking's going to be somewhat hampered, but somewhere in this run feels about right to me. So I'm going back to using BCB fuel again. Just what I happen to have to hand. I've run out of gas canisters and couldn't be bothered to go and buy more. So I have that little bottle of the more, slightly more liquid version of the Fire Dragon BCB fuel. And I'm using this setup today. I've actually forgotten what this is called. Is it, um, is this a honey stove? Something like that. And it does have this funny little adapter. So you can put gel, well, there's a ring thing there for a Trangia burner type thing. I think I've used this before and um, there's a little adapter you can put gel fuel in. As I said, it is a little bit windy. I've put the windshield around it, it might help, I don't know. At least with this one, the flame is a bit lower down compared to my gas stove. So hopefully that gives it a bit more of a fighting chance of get, actually getting some shield from the wind with the windshield. <laughs> That's a very torturous way of explaining a fairly simple concept. I think the basic principle of a fondue, you start by, for some reason, you've got to rub a clove of garlic on the inside of your pot. I'm not sure that's absolutely essential. And then you would normally start by heating up some white wine. In my case, I think I'm going to try and make a slightly more British kind of fondue. So I brought along a bottle of cider. This is Crohn's Organic Cider. Which part of the country is this from? And then I'll melt in some cheese. The cheese is also going to be very British. I'm just going to use cheddar. And I think it actually does work with cheddar. Has a similar melting profile to those Swiss cheeses like Gruyere, etc., that you would normally use for fondue. I didn't bring a knife. The best I can do is just sort of chop that in half with a spork. And then um, I think this is what you're meant to do, is sort of rub that around the inside of the pan, something like that. Next, need to open up the cider. The wine prongs actually also act as a sort of crown top bottle opener. Give that a quick slurp, see what it's like. Not bad. I think the ratio is something like two to one, isn't it? So if you have 200 grams of cheese, you'd have about 100 millilitres of white wine, traditionally, or cider. But I'm going to do this very approximately. Um, I think I have about 150 grams of cheese, which might be a little bit stingy for a typical fondue for one. I'm not sure what an appropriate serving size were, but it just seems like a lot of cheese. Is that going? Yeah, that's going. Pretty sure these conditions are not ideal for the uh, BCB fuel because it is a little bit blustery. But in a way, maybe for something like fondue, perhaps not having extreme heat efficiency is actually a good thing because I don't really want this to be at any point extremely high temperature. As long as this cider can just about, I think it has to come up to the boil, doesn't it? As long as we can achieve that, then everything else after that can be just enough to melt cheese, essentially. I've seen some differences of opinion about how you should integrate the, the corn flour. There should be some corn flour there for thickening. Some of them say sort of mix it in with the cheese, which I was a bit reluctant to do in case this sort of went wrong, because at least I always have the fallback of just eating some cheese, but that seems to be working. So let's put a little bit of that in there. Good thing about having these ugly plastic boxes is that I can give that a bit of a shake now and distribute it around the cheese. There we go, we have some boiling cider in there. I reckon we can start spooning this cheese in. It's supposed to go in relatively gradually, isn't it? Give it a stir to make sure it integrates. At the moment, this just looks very, very wrong, doesn't it? <laughs> Got some boiling cider and I've just put a handful of floury cheddar in there. Nothing about that seemed like a great idea. <laughs> Hopefully this will actually work. A bit more. I hope I haven't um, overdone it with the cider and I'm gonna end up with sort of cheese and cider soup, possibly.
just restock the fuel. Um, I'm starting to slightly panic that I've under provisioned the cheese. I don't know, it's maybe starting to get that kind of thickness now. All right, we might, we might still save this. Could still work. All of the cheese is now in there, getting to the right sort of consistency. Oh, we've got some bubbles and everything. Great. I even brought one of those little fondue forks with me. Might actually put this out for now. I don't think I need much more than that. I mean, that was pretty straightforward, really, wasn't it? You know, not going to win any awards in any uh, Swiss fondue competitions, but I think that's basically just about where it's supposed to be. Maybe you'd like to see the uh, accompaniments. I've kept it pretty basic. Have some chunks of bread there, some chunks of broccoli here, <laughs> some gherkins, picked them up in Sainsbury's in Paddington. There we go. A, um, a British fondue atop a British hill. There is some cheesy bread. I don't know if it's important to watch me eat a piece of melted cheese covered bread, but there we go, just in case you want to see that. Mm. That tastes like fondue. I actually think that has worked. That sort of texture. It's slightly terrifying when you're actually grating the cheese yourself to see the, uh, the amount that goes in. I think I grated something like 150 grams of cheddar broccoli makes it all healthy that is really good and it was so simple and it genuinely does taste like fondue it, it is a fondue but a very weirdly british one should we have a gherkin not great hygiene wise <laughs> it's always seen a slightly weird idea to me dipping a gherkin in melted cheese but um people do this don't they <laughs> mm. that is pretty good what I didn't bring is um, some less aggressive fuel to kind of keep this bubbling over in between. But I can always just give it another burst. I can light that fuel back up and give it another burst if it starts to cool down. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I can be bothered talking. I just want to sit here and eat my fondue in my ditch. I wonder if I've neglected to show you the view from where I'm sitting. There's been some quite low flying planes overhead. There is some sort of, there's some sort of RAF base near here. All done. I don't know if you can see. Is that the light bad there? I don't know. That's the state of the inside of my Billy Can Post fondue. It actually doesn't look too bad, does it? I managed to not burn it too much on the bottom. I wonder if it's perhaps time to open this up. And for once, I'm not doing it in a sort of panic because I've got things burning on the stove. I can, I can take my time and really luxuriate over this. Hashtag leave no trace. And that beautifully pristine ditch. It has been cleansed. <laughs> gonna sound weird if you haven't watched a bunch of my other recent videos isn't it i've had to put a scarf on look it's um getting a little bit chilly i've decided to pack up and move on i did have a glass of wine here and the wine tasting bit will be over on burgundy with tweedy if you're interested to see how that Gevray chevrotin is barely had half a glass of that so um hopefully more of that still to come a bit later on i think i'm possibly going to head in the direction of west woods now I remember there was a standing stone there, which may not be of any real serious age, but it's at the nearest corner to where I am now. And I'd quite like to see it again, see how it's looking now. But this has been a beautiful spot. And I may even actually come back this way and stop off for another glass of wine later. But perhaps if I spin you around, I'll be in silhouette there, terrible camera work. And see what a glorious view it is from here now. And the, the light's really nice. The sun is, uh, it's only just after two o'clock, but the sun is already starting to think about going down. Well, I mean, it's two hours, I suppose, until sunset. But I think that gives me enough time to pop over to West Woods, have a quick look at the stone, and then maybe come back this way and head back to the station. But yes, really taken with that rather beautiful ditch atop Hooish Hill. Really nice spot, especially this bit. I'm almost grateful for that fence there because it sort of cuts it off from the path a little bit and uh, as I say this is still open access land but nobody has walked past me and disturbed me while I've been having my lunch which has been really nice. I can pop back through this little handy gap in the fence here through the gorse bush once more, rejoin, rejoin the path. Ugh, oh god that hurts. <laughs> and um, hopefully on to West Woods. Really it's one of my favourite ditches. <laughs> I want to savour that view for another moment before I leave the top of Huish Hill here. Really lovely today, really quite a wintry sky. It's the tail end of November, but it 
definitely feels like winter already today. That definitely looks like snow to me, not just frost. Well, definitely has snowed here, hasn't it? Seems to be only on the absolute utmost bit of the hills. We start to head downhill a little bit more over here. I can't see quite so much of it. Incredibly pleased with myself that I've managed to realize that long held ambition, week long held ambition to make a fondue in a ditch. It worked pretty well. I really am very, very pleased with that. And what a lovely ditch. What a beautiful located ditch. You know, normally with ditches, you have to make some sort of sacrifice. They're not always on top of a hill like that with a great outlook, with a great view. So that is a real prime ditch. And I think I, uh, I did well to, uh, to log that in the, uh, the ditch bank. <laughs> the, um, that, that memory of particularly high quality ditches. This is now one corner of Westwoods, conveniently the closest corner to where I was back there, Hoosh Hill. I don't think it's actually far from the road, the Standing Stone. I think previously I got to it from the interior of the woods. I had to beat my way through Holly Thicket. I wonder if it might be easier actually starting from the road. Not far off this bit, I think. There was at least a bit of undergrowth to climb through, but it's vaguely around here. A bit challenging to spot because all of these beech trees have a colour, colour that is not entirely dissimilar to a sarsen stone. There it is. You can probably hear the, uh, the road. It really isn't far from the road. So there it is, the Standing Stone in West Woods. The Megalithic Portal website, that has uh, the more or less precise location. Let me see how well it did on this occasion. Yeah, I mean, it's close enough. You do, you do still have to wander around in the, uh, the, the general area a little bit to find the exact spot, but it gets you more or less into the right corner of the woods. I don't think it's very well known about apart from that. So it's only really uh, megalith nerds <laughs> like me who would come and seek it out. No idea how long it's been standing. And as I probably said, the previous time I, I came here a couple of years ago now, was it when I was walking the, the Wandstike path maybe? It could be very recent. It could be 20th century even, uh, who knows? I don't think it's been there for a very long time, potentially. But I think this is the only, you know, properly sort of standing stone in West Woods. And this is, of course, as I'm sure all of you know, the place where the sarsen stones, at least for Stonehenge, were supposedly sourced from. It's quite a nice thing. It obviously has been put up by man. I don't think there's any suggestion this could have just naturally been standing on its end like that. Seems a bit too far-fetched. And it's a bit of a shame you can hear the road just there. But it is, it's a nice spot. Something a bit special about the fact that it isn't signposted. No interpretation board from Historic England or English Heritage, whatever they're called. Just a standing stone in the woods that uh, you would only find if you really went out of your way to find it. Lovely, worth the detour, I think. Pretty much just gonna head back the way I came, I think, because that is the most direct line. Is that an interesting shot? I don't know, might come out terrible. Still can't quite get over the, uh, the weirdness of snow in November. I suppose we are up on the top of a hill. Is this 200 something meters up? And there was a flurry of snow earlier this week, even in London. Back to Hoosh Hill and hopefully we'll get a little bit of a glimpse of some pre-sunset sky. I don't know if I quite have time to sit around until sunset proper, or nor necessarily the inclination because it's going to get pretty cold, I imagine, as soon as the sun goes down. But at least uh, for a little while, sit here and enjoy some of this nice late afternoon light. Maybe I'll go back to my much loved stretch of ditch from earlier. Oh, sorry, terrible camera work. I am negotiating a ditch. I absolutely love this gap in the fence and the fact that there is a prickly gorse bush to negotiate. You've got to want to come here to come here and I definitely do. Look at that. Isn't that a beautiful scene? Now you may think I'm gonna snack on some gherkins with a glass of wine now, but I've actually just removed them from my bag because I'm a bit nervous about them leaking when the bag is flat rather than upright. But where else do you get sunset scenes with a jar of Sainsbury's gherkins and a bottle of Gervais Chambertin in the foreground? 
I'll be honest, it is a little bit chilly. I, I suppose I have a scarf I could put on. Some proxy for a sunset right now. The sun is over there in the sky looking very orangey, yellowy sort of colour and majestic. And uh, I have this whole hilltop to myself. Don't know if you can see there yet another one of those RAF type planes. Are there some sort of reconnaissance planes flying into the sun over or flying past the sun over there? Reluctant I am to leave this beautiful bit of ditch with that sun starting to talk about setting. I think if I don't leave now, I might not make the train and then uh, I've got two hours, another two hours in the dark and the cold to wait around and that wouldn't be much fun. So time to head on, I think, back to Pusey. Plane still doing the rounds off to the right hand side of the screen. Look at that sun. Well, I can enjoy it from the, um, from the bottom of the hill still probably. Goodbye bench. That would make a fantastic spot to watch that sunset. You'd be looking over the, uh, off the right arm there. I'm sure that's fine. Might get a crick in your neck, perhaps. Still a very good spot. Do love a good bench. Right, down the hill. Try not to break my ankle in the process. Passing through Oregon and closed pubs will never stop being a sad sight. Passing through the mean streets of Bethnal Green once again. Still doesn't look how I remember it. The official moment of sunset has now passed. I think it was eight minutes past four, just a couple of minutes ago. I don't think I've missed much by not holding out on top of the hill there and I would have just had a, a dark cold walk home so uh, perhaps this is for the best hopefully I'm in good time for that five o'clock train from Pusey and uh, which is a nice sky but I don't think there's much in terms of sunset drama to be had this evening alas back to the Kennet and Avon canal it is starting to get a bit gloomy, but I think at this rate I will probably get back to Pusey without needing to put a head torch or anything on. I forgot to mention on the way out, this is actually a branch of the River Avon here, just north of Pusey. I have made it to Pusey a little bit early in the end, what, 20 minutes before the train, which is probably going to be really packed again. It sounds like it's another five coach service, which will be really inadequate for a Friday evening. At least it's heading into London rather than out of London, but probably not going to be a particularly fun journey home. Anyway, you don't need to hear that because you don't have to <laughs> sit through that. Not a particularly ambitious walk today. It was just sort of up to the top of, well, I suppose I got to Westwood, didn't I? Up to Westwood and back again, but I did what I wanted to do. I succeeded in what I set out to achieve, which was to make a fondue in a ditch. And I thought it was a particularly lovely ditch. And I actually thought the fondue suited this surprisingly wintry weather for November. That's going to be it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. See you on the next one. Hopefully it's not going to be <laughs> the too distant future this time.